Welcome back to the Meet the Athlete podcast. In today's episode, I'm joined by Matthew Stonia, off the back of one of the biggest seasons of his life, if not the biggest, where he's competed for England at the Commonwealth Games, Team GB at the European Championships, set a new under-23 British record, signed his first professional contract, and that's just to scratch the surface. So it was great to sit down with someone that I've known from such a young age in the running world and just talk about his successes and how this season has gone in general. So sit back, relax, and enjoy this new episode of the Meet the Athlete podcast. So guys, thank you, Matt, for joining me on the podcast today. How are we feeling? Yeah, good, thanks. Thanks for having me on. No problem at all. So obviously this is a pretty big guest. Off the back of your pretty, some would say your breakthrough season, how has the last six months been for you? Just sum it up a little bit for me. Uh, A bit of a whirlwind. Nothing that happened I expected to really happen. Uh, And I think that made it all the better. Just everything was like a day by day and was just, just amazing. Just like a season I'll never forget for all the right reasons as well. So uh, yeah, it's been, it's been the best six months of my life by quite a way, I'd say. Yeah, I can imagine. I mean, um, yeah, I mean, going to your first, your first proper games and then backing up with the second, like within a few kind of a few weeks later, which, which one of the two would you say was better? So for those watching at home, Matt, you obviously went to the Commonwealth Games of England and then went to the European Championships with Team Gene B um, a couple of weeks later. So if you had to pick one, which was your favourite? Um, I'd have to go commies quite easily, actually. Um, just the home, the home kind of vibe. It was on everyone's TVs. You knew people going. You were quite safe in the setting. You felt comfortable in the in the country where you train and live anyway. Um, and just the home support. And it was the first games as well. So that was my first major champ. So commies actually quite comfortably. Not to say Euros wasn't amazing, but Commies just tops everything. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, for people that follow the channel, they'll know that I was there watching you on the day. And obviously I could see you kind of g the crowd on, like getting them going. Yeah. Was it safe? It was just... it... Sorry, carry like, on. I knew, I knew people were, were coming, which is also an added bonus to try even harder, run extra hard. And then I knew there'd be people spotted around throughout the stadium. And one of the coaches, the England coach is Kyle, and all of the coaches have been amazing at commies and Euros. He just said, go out there and enjoy it. And there's only so much you can enjoy three and three quarter laps when you're in that much pain. So the only bit you could really enjoy was walking onto the onto the track, round to the 1500 start. I just tried to soak it in as much as I could and kind of G the crowd up. Even if they didn't know who I was, it was just good fun. <laughs> Is it is it safe to say that going into the commies you were very confident or was there some nerves creeping in? How how were you feeling? Um, I was quite relaxed. I knew I was in pretty good shape, and I think it wasn't the expectation on me wasn't very good. I didn't have much publicity going into the champs, obviously off off the back of the Scots because they stole the show and rightly so. Um, so I kind of went in under the radar, and my goal was really to make the final. So once I'd made that final, I just enjoyed it as much as I could. Um, and I think it worked. And in the race, being able to just relax and enjoy it probably helped me. Yeah, for sure. So what were, what were your thoughts going through your head in that Commonwealth Games final? The Kenyans took it out pretty quickly. Um, and obviously, for someone that's kind of fairly new to this elite top level running, that must have been pretty scary, no? Yeah, it was the 54 first half. I was like, oh, dear, we're in trouble or not where I'm in trouble. Like it's the fastest I've ever been through by a good second and a half. And then you're just thinking, hanging on. And obviously you turn to like the negative thoughts of, oh, I'm going to be miles behind here or whatever. And then I kind of just felt, I felt good. So I knew if I stuck within the group, I was on for a good time. And then it was the start of the last lap. I think I was on about two, must've been about 235, 236. And I thought, I'm going to have to run a sub 60 for a PB, which I know I can. Yeah. So that last lap, it was really like, I know I'm on for a good time. Then then the legs feel a bit better as well. So the first two laps were really hard and just a bit of a concern because it was like, it was new territory for me, a pace I'd never run before in a 15. And then I guess at the end, you're like, well, I can do it. 
and um, it paid off and I didn't die too much, um, not as much as some of the others and then managed to overtake a few on the last lap, which has kind of been my method of racing this summer to just sit near the back and then pick up a few scouts on the last lap. No, for sure. It's definitely been successful for you. But obviously that was probably an insane experience, something that I'll probably never ever experience, but pretty cool to watch from obviously a close friend. We grew up running together. But if you had to pick one highlight of this of this summer, one moment that you could relive, what, what would it be? Um, that commies final. And the only other thing, I'd say the MC car win. It was the only thing I actually like won this summer, which I know I was never going to win a, a commies or a Euro or a British chance or whatever. So being able to win quite a big race unexpectedly as well. That that evening from winning and then watching the elite 10K race and then going around with you trying to find athletes and stuff and like just chat to people. That I say that evening as a whole was the best kind of two hours of just enjoying like athletics, being able to watch it, enjoy it and meet and chat to people there. So those are the two highlights. Yeah, sure. I'm, gl- I'm glad I'm in there somewhere. Yeah. So um, so is there anything that you would put this, obviously you've had great success over the last six months, but this has not been a, like a short term. It's not suddenly happened overnight. Is there one thing that you would kind of put your success down to, like hard work, a particular way of eating, a particular way of training? Obviously you've got like the, uh, the Norwegians, they love their double threshold days, things like that. Is there anything that you would kind of attribute your success to? Um, just years of consistency. When you build it up year by year, if you've been running for two years, you're not going to be as good as someone who's been doing it for four or five. So every year I'm just getting better just by running for another year. And I think that people underestimate just how running can just help in the, in the long run, really. Um, and then I say I kind of broke out to a certain extent got coming to Loughborough. Um, well, I must have trained, we all trained at Invicta for four or five years together and it worked whilst we were there and it was a great social or whatever but Mm. it came to a point where I needed to kind of change the training and implement new things and really kind of increase session volume um, more tempos that kind of stuff so I think switching to uni really kind of helped me jump Um, and then just being part of the uni environment and the runners we have here just kind of keeps you going on that upward trajectory and uh, I say that's probably the main thing. So yeah, Loughborough is probably my main, my main kind of thing that's helped me. Yeah, the main, the main difference. Obviously, well, some people might not know, but Canterbury has actually been a pretty good source of like some really good top level athletes over the years. Obviously, you got yourself. There was Bobby Clay a few years ago. Obviously, your girlfriend Alex Millard. She's definitely up there in terms of female athletes. But for some reason, athletes just don't stay around Canterbury. Um, but it's just because we don't really have the infrastructure like a place like Loughborough does. Um, we don't have that depth in kind of elite, elite top, uh, top level athletes. But, um, but yeah, no, it's great to see that you're obviously succeeding at Loughborough or going to from strength to strength, really. So over the summer, do you know how many races you actually completed? Do you know? Oh, 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 you know, oh, no, I think, I think it's 17 or 18, but okay. that includes heats and stuff. Yeah. So, okay. So in total, you ran 18 races, which is, you've actually got nailed on the head there. That's obviously pretty insane. I think I did like eight and I was knackered. So fair play to you for that. But after that last race of the season, you obviously did the New York mile. What did you do in those kind of the two weeks after? Did you just take complete rest? Did you go traveling? What did you get up to? Yeah. So I just like, you're finished in New York and we were all just so kind of dead. It's like a build up of, four or five months of just hard work, nonstop racing. And then it all comes, it's a bit over the top, but it all comes crashing down to like, oh, it's done. So I had a couple of days in New York doing the classic touristy stuff of just going up buildings, eating rubbish food, and then managed to fortunately get away to New York for a few days and have a have an actual holiday. I guess the life of an athlete, you, you can really only go away on a proper holiday in around that September time um so i think it is important to make the most of that and i was able to do so and then kind of headed back to loughborough and i actually came back to loughborough after two weeks of no running and it was like i have no desire to run i just i'm not ready yet i just don't feel like i want to run i don't feel like my legs are recovered 
And then after two or three days in Loughborough that you run out of things to do in Loughborough very quickly. And then it was like, all right, let's, let's get back on it now. And, and obviously everyone else was here running. So it kind of helps you get motivated quickly again. So it was a good two and a half weeks off. I needed it. Um, but back into the swing of things now. No, for sure. I definitely know what you mean. That, that kind of that time to decompress, you almost like forget how good it feels when you run. And actually it feels like a bit of a chore to come back. But then when, once you get that buzz again, it's such a, yeah. such an amazing feeling. But obviously this summer was insane for you, as I keep saying, but it did lead to something pretty, pretty big, which was you obviously signed your first professional contract. So do you want to just quickly talk about who you've just signed with um, and just talk a little bit about it, how it came about? Yeah, so I'm now signed with Nike, which is amazing for, for a good few years now. And I guess you're living the dream as like a professional athlete, um, which is still mad to me because I'm still in a uni house doing university. Like it hasn't changed anything, I, I hope, about me since I've signed. But um, it really all just came off the back of commies. I think I was near or near enough that, the sponsorship level after running 335 and then running that 332 getting the under 23 british record and also placing relatively high at commies in seventh i think it turned a few heads and fortunately one of them was nike yeah and then kind of spoke a bit and then after euros or during euros we kind of spoke a bit more and a contract was drawn up and it was a contract that i was going to take and um just allow me to kind of live my life as a professional athlete and enjoy it and it is the company that you're kind of lying if when you're young it's not the one you want to join you like I didn't re really need too many kit drops from them because half my stuff is Nike anyway I don't have to change my shoes because Invincibles are the best shoe next percent are the best racing shoe so it in that respect is quite nice that I can keep everything the same rather than trying a new set of shoes and clothing that might not work it might lead to the odd injury here and there so that was all kind of part of the reason for signing with them as well just meant that I could continue doing what I was doing in what I was doing so and yeah I've had some amazing experiences with them already went to Chelsea last weekend mm. and uh, in the Nike box which I'd never have the privilege of doing um so yeah no it's been very cool and hopefully it uh continues for the next few years yeah for sure and i imagine that Chelsea game was pretty cool for the first 94 minutes or whatever it was and <laughs> yeah well the game wasn't great but um you can't take away having an experience in a box and all that kind of stuff but yeah casemiro ruined ruined the uh, afternoon well you'll be glad to know he'll never ever be on the podcast but <laughs> but yeah Good. so how, do, how does how do you feel when you get, I don't know how it, how it all kind of unraveled, but did you get a call from your agent and how did it feel when you just kind of heard those first night, uh, heard, heard those first words like Nike are interested in you? Like, cause that is, that's obviously like, it's definitely up there in terms of feelings, I imagine. Yeah, it, but it doesn't feel, I don't know at what point uh, a contract feels real. I, I say for me, it was when I got the elite kit before Lausanne and a guy just came up to me and was like, Matt Stoney I was like yes and then he just handed me a bag and that's when it kind of felt real um mm -hmm. you do a few kind of meeting not meetings uh, I say informal talks getting to know the the Nike marketing manager because he's essentially like your boss um and then they get to know you and it, it's just kind of developing that athlete relationship with the company which is important um and then obviously there's contractual size and documents and paperwork but um that's all part of any job really I'm sure you have to sign stuff so I think the elite kit was kind of the first first time where I thought wow this is real um but yeah it's it's it is still surreal when I sometimes just have to like think oh I'm a professional athlete um yeah it's a bit weird <laughs> yeah so I mean your average Joe like myself sits at home and dreams about moments like that um and i will do for ages but is there any part of you that kind of after signing that contract was a bit like oh like it's it's not quite what i expected it to be or is it still that cloud nine feeling and it's and it's still insane i think it's still mainly cloud nine obviously it comes with a lot more pressures because you're not just performing for yourself anymore which i've always 
done obviously myself friends family etc but obviously there's a there's a money side to it which you you'd be lying if at some point it probably doesn't get into your head but i think it is just trying to stay that same person training the same way not doing more because you feel obliged to do more because you're being sponsored by one of the biggest brands in the world it's just kind of they signed you off the back of what you did last year so you don't need to change what you're going to do this year because of it and i think that's quite important and being here kept level-headed by my coaches and friends and family and just the setup um it's it's pretty similar but at the end of the day you know you you've got to wear a pair of nike shoes and it's like oh that's not that bad is it no. so it's pretty cool yeah so obviously the first competition i think you got to wear your nike elite kit was at one of the diamond leagues if i'm correct is that right yeah, that was lausanne yeah yeah so that i think that's when kind of you'd officially kind of told the world a little bit because um as a close friend of yours i mean i hadn't like knowing that it was fully done and i know a lot of your other mates at uni didn't know it was fully complete until you walked out into that stadium in the full nike blue turquoise um turquoise kit but um some people i don't know if people have the same sort of opinion but i've spoken to some other guys that are kind of sponsored and i get the imp impression from the elite world that nike are a bit more cutthroat a bit more kind of like numbers driven compared to say um another company that maybe haven't got the top elite athletes, but they're more focusing on a bit more of kind of a friendly athlete sort of team, if that makes sense, like a lot more of like a social media presence. Do you get any sort of help in terms of, sorry, there's a really long winded question, but do uh, you get any support and help in terms of like how to then run your social media, how you're meant to be portrayed on social media? Do they give you any pointers or do they just keep saying, or well, just do what you've been doing? Yeah, I think, Maybe in the past, some people might say Nike have had this kind of persona, which maybe they have. Um, I'm not really one to get into the politics of that. I wasn't, I didn't really focus on that kind of stuff and I've been given a great opportunity by them so I can only be thankful. But um, yeah, that, yeah, it's kind of hard. It's, you need to repeat the question again. <laughs> What was the final bit? So do you get any kind of help and training in, in regards to how you're then meant to portray yourself on social media? Or is it a case of just keep doing what you're doing, basically? Yeah, you have a few kind of things which you're suggested to do. Like it is important to show basically the world that you are a Nike athlete. And obviously, I'd like to do that at the same time. So obviously, getting a photo of stuff in the kit is quite cool. And it helps on social media and social media is as you know you've got to build a platform for you to be noticed so if i can do that through nike it gives me maybe a better opportunity because it's a a well-recognized brand but um there's nothing to this i see like people like on and stuff it's like daily just posts and stuff of of them and they're obviously that's kind of their mold and their kind of business idea which is obviously it's working because they need to maybe try a bit harder in their marketing as opposed to Nike who everyone knows who they are already. So there's nothing too serious, nothing, nothing that makes me not sleep at night because I feel like I haven't done this or done that, which okay. is good in, in keeping kind of relaxed and just focused on the job, which is running and not, not trying to get, if I go to the session tonight, my focus is running, not trying to get a photo of me running, that kind of thing. So yeah, it, it's not bad. Yeah, no, for sure. That, that's what I was trying to ask you and yeah. I just worded it horrifically. So yeah, no, you've answered the question. No, no, it, it was fine. I just <laughs> zoned out. <laughs> no, it's absolutely fine. So obviously, recently signing with Nike, I know which shoes you use because um, I'm pretty sure you use very, very similar ones. But could you just give um, the viewers at home, the listeners at home, just a quick rundown of what shoes you use from the Nike range and what you use them for? Yeah, so as you know, Invincible for the long run, that's pretty staple. Uh, I think about 80% of long runners in Loughborough wear Invincibles for the long run. It's it's just a good shoe at the end of the day. Um, and then Dragonflies for racing, which is obviously the their spike, their super shoe. Yep. And then next percents for road road racing slash running. Um, and then I like wearing the Streak Fly actually on the track. Um, the next percent stack height sometimes causes my ankles to have a couple issues on the track. So. I'm pretty comfortable and used to wearing a street fly. So it's not a massive list of shoes. Sometimes I swap in a trail shoe for the Sunday long run or 
or whatever long run if it's really muddy, which you never know this time of the year. It, it is more likely, but it's a pretty simple rotation, but I think it's quite a good rotation. Yeah, no, I think simplicity is key, actually. I see some, well, I'm, I fall into this category of people that just have an endless number of shoes, it seems, for, and they just can't make their mind up and then they start blaming the shoes, which is something that I do. I'll go, I had a crap session because I wore that shoe instead of that shoe. Yeah. And it seems like you've got um, a nice, simple set of shoes that you, you believe in, which is um, which is pretty cool. So, as I mentioned earlier, you've obviously had some time off after the New York mile. So maybe fitness isn't quite where you'd like it to be at the moment. Is that how you, would you agree with that? Yeah, for sure. I think uh, especially that kind of longer distance aerobic base is something I need to get kind of back on the grind doing. Um, that doesn't come in two, three weeks. That takes two, three months. So I'm definitely at a starting point. But um, I like this time of year because you feel yourself getting better. Already I feel a lot fitter than I was two weeks ago and I haven't been doing that much. So hopefully the trend continues throughout winter. Yeah, for sure. So what are the kind of the short term plans? Is there a plan to do, say, the Liverpool Cross at the end of November? And are you thinking of doing the short, short course or the long course like you did last year? So what's, what's your plans? Um, at the moment, it would be to do Liverpool long course. It's that's what I'd like. And if I'm fit enough, I believe I'd be able to at least challenge for that kind of Euro spot. But um, it's not the be all and end all. I, I decided to race in New York at the risk of maybe not making Euros. And I'm I'm happy I made that decision. I'm settled in it. Um, I know I'm playing a bit of catch up, but at the end of the day, uh, next summer is the primary focus. So not making this Euros isn't going to ruin my year essentially. But at the same point, it would be lovely to make another GB team. You, you never know when's you're going to be your last one. So you might as well go for all of them. Um, we'll know mid-November. I don't want to say too much about whether I do the long course or short course. Um, I guess the fitness will really decide on that. Um, but I would like to do the long course. So we'll have to see. And then after that, I think the main other cross race is Bucks. Um, I'd love to. The main goal is to win the team at Bucks. It's the only team event we have. Um, and Loughborough haven't won it in years. I don't know anyone at the uni who can really remember a, a Loughborough men's team victory. So we've got some uh, work to do to get over on Birmingham from last year, a bit of revenge. So that would be the other goal, but that's a long term in the future still. Very cool. So obviously you're, you're coached by uh, Chris and Sonia McGeorge from Loughborough. So when it comes to making that decision of, between the long course and the short course, do they have quite any, a big input into that? Or is it kind of a decision that you're going to make kind of on your, on your own? Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, I'll know what shape I'm in and I'll, I'll tell them they'll be able to see as well from sessions, whether or not I'm in that 10 K cross shape, which is, which is quite a different fitness to that 1500 short course shape. So we'll have to make a decision at some point um, on the trajectory I'm going though. I would like to think I'll be near enough 10 K shape Um so yeah, they'll they'll keep a, keep a watch on me. Um, Chris is not notoriously a massive fan of uh, cross country. Really, he sees it with a bit more importance. But that just comes from their backgrounds as well. With Chris being more of a an eight guy and a, a track centered guy, so I'm trying to convert him day by day. But uh, it takes a bit of time. Yeah, for sure. So. Um, I've heard great things about your coaches. How did you find the transition from, say, your local club coach to then changing to a more kind of university-based coach, which have now obviously transitioned to be your full-time coaches? But how did you find that kind of that, that transition? Was it quite easy? Um, I think I, w I was pretty prepared for it. We kind of arranged that I was going to move on to a, a new coach at uni and my coach at home, Peter, was going to have just that kind of input, that more kind of... Um, uh i've forgotten what the word is now but like, yeah the um more kind of a mentor role with his experience in the sport and his connections which have been like very valuable for me and useful still so he was going to kind of take that role and i think he's been great in accept accepting that to some extent i'm sure it's hard for a lot of coaches when they see their athletes um and it's a natural progression move to uni and they might take on a new coach but um Chris and Sonia and Peter they all get on very well and they have a good relationship and um that's useful in communication which is important but um yeah Chris and Sonia have been pretty much since I moved to Loughborough 
obviously the initial plan was to be coached by George Gann, who sadly passed away. And it was just a natural thing for myself and pretty much everyone as a fresher then to go to Chris and Sonia, who were pretty much the only other coach endurance coaches at Loughborough. And uh, yeah, it's, it's worked ever since and why change what works. So, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Well, no, obviously, obviously whatever they're doing is working. I might have to, might have to move on to Loughborough once I finish my university degree. Yeah, well, it's prob- the weather's not as good, but um, it's probably cheaper than Canterbury, so. It's, yeah, I mean, I'm living in Maidstone at the moment, but um, and it's not too bad. But yeah, the, the Loughborough is definitely a nicer area. Let's just say that. Let, a lot less risk of getting stuck. <laughs> <Maidstone>. <laughs> um, so you've obviously got lots of strengths, your determination, your long as fuck legs. Um, but if you're being honest, what is one thing that kind of you would have to say is like your weakness? One thing that maybe could set you off in terms of preparing for a big race? Um. I'd say maybe in terms of general training, I'd say maybe I'm a bit um, weak with the the longer mileage. I'm a bit precious, possibly. I've never really hit that 80 plus mile mark, um, partly because I, I feel like I don't need to. And I'm not sure if my body would hold up. Uh, and that kind of coincides with probably the S&C. Um, that's probably my other kind of weak point, which kind of is part of the reason why I'm not really stringing those kind of weeks together I think I'm just a bit smaller need to get a bit better in the gym but um I'm sure that'll come with age as well but I see myself on the start line of 1500s against people like Rosmus and even like Jakob as well who are just a lot bigger than me um so I know there's definitely room for improvement in that department yeah for sure you don't realize actually how big some of the other guys are like yeah. um, Josh Kerr like when until they're stood next to you on the start line, it's like, whoa, actually, <laughs> they're yeah. actually pretty, you know, they're dense. They're not, they're not fat by any means. They're dense and muscular, but, um, but yeah, no, it's pretty cool. So this summer, as, as mentioned many times, it's been a pretty insane summer, but has there been one person that you've been able to meet as a result of this that's kind of stuck and you've gone, wow, that's actually, that's actually pretty cool. I did see this, I thought really hard about it and, it's so hard to answer because I've met so many people. Um, the majority have all been great and friendly and welcoming. Um, I, I don't know if I could name, I can name maybe five people, but I couldn't rank them. I could say baby Jake and big Jake, Jake Hayward and Jake Whiteman have been great. Um, I've got to know them obviously being in the same team as them for Euros um, and then going to the New York mile with them as well. That was great. Um Zach Seddon is one of the funniest guys I've met. Um, he was at commies and Euros. It, yeah, I think it commies and Euros. And he just made me feel very like uh, just part of the group, pretty welcomed. He's probably more immature than I am. So that was kind of nice to have some sort of immaturity here. Um, but then just all kind of the Loughborough guys, like I've been with Ben Patterson pretty much every race this year. And having him around has been great. Um, it's so hard. There's so many people. Um, yeah, basically every middle distance runner who does 1500, who's done a major race this year, I can say is a good person and a pretty cool guy. Much cooler than I am. So, yeah. <laughs> don't say that. No, no, that's a good answer. That's a respectable answer. You don't want to burn too many bridges by saying a certain certain person and then everyone else gets offended so that's absolutely yeah, that's the thing as well there's too many people to really name but everyone on team gb commonwealths everyone at the new york mile everyone in lausanne yeah all of them all of them all of them just great yeah. okay <laughs> i've got one final question or topic that i'd like to touch on before we move on to some fun trivia questions is um so for those that don't know you're in a relationship with alex minard or another some would say sub elite borderline elite um athlete at at Loughborough so just one thing I wanted to talk about is about how would you kind of balance your relationship with running when your partner is so kind of into their running as well does that make sense does it ever get competitive um to a certain extent sometimes there's obviously there's always going to be highs and lows when you're running for for either of you both of you at different times so you always have to kind of look after the other person if they're going through a for an injury or an illness and maybe the other person's running really well um for example i couldn't go to the world student games in 
March where and Alex was able to go um, and well deserved because I was ill. So I was down and she was out in Portugal and then vice versa. I go to Euro champs for the week in in August and she's kind of having that off season period of not doing much. So it kind of has its highs and lows, but because you're both runners, you 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 understand it. You get you get what it's like to be a runner. You you understand the the competing and um training and being apart because you've got this that that race so um i think we've we've got a good uh, balance and we understand what it's like and both being at loughborough you do you do see each other most of the time anyway so you don't feel like you're struggling to find time to see each other so yeah i think we've definitely got things on a good um a good trajectory and seem to have worked things out in terms of competing and all that kind of stuff and hopefully next summer maybe sooner she'll join that professional kind of realm and i'm i'm sure she's got it in her to kind of get to that next level um and i know she wants to as well so that's good oh for sure yeah i mean it, it's definitely going to happen at some point whether it's this season next season yeah um, she's definitely got it in her for sure um but it sounds like you two have got it kind of very much kind of sorted out you've got a good balance because i was just having a conversation with somebody the other day and i said that if my girlfriend was a runner i'm not 100 sure about <laughs> Um, so those listening at home I'm laughing because Matt's plugging his laptop in that's absolutely fine um, but yeah I was just saying I don't know how easy I'd be able to find the balance of kind of keeping our running not competitive in terms of if one person's injured or the other one keeps getting PBs and the other one's not getting like not improving I just thought that maybe might conflict but no it sounds like you've got it kind of down to a T there so I don't know if you've watched um or listen to any of the other episodes, but I have now got some trivia questions for you. So there's five trivia questions. They're about running in general, but a couple of them are about you or um, your running. So, okay. so far I've had two guests and they both scored four out of five. Obviously these, these questions, it's difficult to measure the difficulty level, whether I'm giving the same difficulty um, to everyone. So you have to take, take them with a pinch of salt and don't be too upset if you get zero, okay? Yeah. I'm sure none of us who do this are competitive at all. So uh. no, no, all professional or sub elite athletes. I'm sure there's no competitiveness at all. <laughs> okay, right. So the first question I've got is: Do you know the first ever time you ran at Parkrun? Was it 20 minutes on the dot? No, it was 20:06. But I'm going to give you that because that is very close. If you said, like, it, I know it was Bushy Park as well. It was Bush. Yeah, there you go. Okay. Definitely going to give yeah. you the point for that because you were only six seconds out, which is actually pretty tough. If someone asked me my first park run, I could actually tell you, but that's because I've researched it recently. You have done about 500 as well. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. Okay. One out of one. I'm going to give you that one. Nice. Okay. So you now hold the under 23 British record for, for the 1500 of 332.5. You took it off of Josh Kerr, but what was the record before? Bef what was Josh Kerr's time? Yeah. I think it was close, like 332.52. Correct. Bang on. Oh. I, I, hadn't, I had no idea about that record. I assumed it was um, Jake Hayward from the Olympics the year before because I knew he was under 23 and ran a ridiculous time. And then only afterwards did someone say, you beat Josh's Kerr, Josh Kerr's. So, yeah. yeah, that was very lucky. Yeah, no, right. you're smashing it so far, 100% success rate. So the third question, I don't know if this is a hard question or not. I feel like I knew the answer, but um, obviously you recently signed for Nike, but where in the world is their HQ found? It, the Nike headquarters. Is it, I don't know if it's a, a trick question. Is it like, it's in Oregon. Is it like Beaver Town or something? Yeah, that is, that's bang on. Is it, yeah. is so it? Oregon, oh, yes. Everton. So yeah, you got it. Everton. That's only because I've had recent orders from Nike. So I, I don't know where it comes up, but it says Beaverton on it somewhere. That is, that is, um, yeah, <laughs> very well done. Okay, this one is a bit of a road question. I don't know if you're going to get this one. Um, so see, those who don't know, your sporting idol is Tom Brady, correct? Yeah. So arguably the most or the best uh, American footballer of all time. But do you, do you know his record time over the 40-yard dash, which is approximately 36 metres? Oh, it was like one of the slowest when he did it. That's why... It I'm going to give you a range. So I'll give you... 
if you get within 0.2 seconds of it. I'll right. give it um, 36 meters. Most people, I know like the good guys run like 4.4, but those guys are seriously quick. I don't know what I'd even run. Uh, I'm going to add 5.65. Uh, 5. 5. Oh, so it's 5.28. So you're, you're not quite that's fine, within that's fine. boundaries. Um, oh, but yeah, a bit slower than you might expect, being as um, some of the quicker guys are like 4.4. But I yeah, guess I've done him a bit of injustice there. That's. Not that's yeah meant to be my goat and I'm having a go at him. So oh, oh well. I won't tell him. <laughs> okay, the fifth and final question, and um, this is I'm really sorry about this. Is a horrible question. Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> How old is Nike's youngest ever professional athlete? Oh, this is going to be disgraceful. <laughs> it's probably like it's probably some kid before they're even born. It's probably like. Michael Jordan. Okay. okay, I'll give David you the point David. if you can tell me either the age, the nationality, or the sport. Um, sport nineteen seventy-two. It's not going to be a. And he and I'll give you I'll give you a clue. Um, his sponsorship began January two thousand and twenty-one. January 2021. So he must have been really young then. Um, That's uh, a horrible, horrible question. Sport, what sport? Um, trying to think like tennis or like golf. Is there a golf? No, I don't know any young golfers. Um, uh, <laughs> I'm so stuffed. Um, do I know this person? No, no, no. Okay. Um, I'm going to go with... It's going to be athletics. I was just back athletics. Okay. Uh, he's going to be American. And do I have to guess how old? I'm going to say eight years old. <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to give you the point because I said if you could get one of them correct. Right. So he is eight years old. <laughs> what he was when he was right. sponsored. So he's a Brazilian footballer um, who was sponsored when he was eight years old. I think that's just crazy to sponsor an eight-year-old footballer. I mean... Um, and his name is Kawan Basil. Pretty, pretty I didn't even think of football, actually. I forget Nike kind of do football. But, um, yeah, no, fair play to the kid. I'm sure he's going to... I'm sure he'll help his family and hopefully his... Have a bright, bright... Like his, his, yeah, all that kind of stuff. I don't know where he's from in Brazil, but I'm sure I'm sure that'll come in very handy for him. Yeah, for sure. Hopefully, I, hopefully in 20 years' time, we'll, it'll win a World Cup or something, and then you can go back to this and go, yeah. Yeah, there you go. I featured on the Cold Running podcast, yeah, for sure. <laughs> no, well, there you go. So you are still... So we've now had three guests that have all scored four out of five. That is incredible. I, I actually thought you'd lost it, and I was like, ah, oh, he's got it wrong. And then you came up with that eight at the end. So yeah, fair, fair play. Yeah, take that. But yeah, no, thank you very much, Matt, for joining me on the, the Meet the Athlete podcast. Um, we wish you all the best for the rest of your season. Um, and yeah, thanks for coming on. Yeah, I'm sure I'll see you, at, hopefully see you at Liverpool. Oh, you will see me there, just not for very long. <laughs> all <laughs> right, care. thanks very much. Cheers. Yeah.